For the past 20 years, the war in Afghanistan has been one of the key issues defining the relationship between our two countries. With US troops now withdrawing, there's an important opportunity to reassess our shared interests and our shared priorities. During this brief introduction, we'd like to highlight three of these. The first, perhaps most important priority we share is the need to seek a political settlement with the Taliban and to prevent the descent into an Afghan civil war and the terrorism, instability, and humanitarian crisis, which would almost certainly be the result if this were to happen. The second priority we share is the need to identify and support policies and mechanisms which ensure strategic stability in South Asia. Nowhere else in the world do three nuclear armed states with powerful militaries adjoin each other as they do in China, India, and Pakistan. The mechanisms we've been relying on for generations to manage tensions and resolve conflicts may no longer be the right ones to get the job done, not least because they no longer reflect the reality of US-China competition and the complicated balance of power between our countries. The third priority we share is the need to find concrete areas where the United States and Pakistan can expand and deepen our cooperation from climate change and pandemic relief to trade and technology. We are honored that Pakistan's ambassador to the United States, His Excellency Dr. Asad Majid Khan is here with us today in person to provide insights into Pakistan's strategic thinking on these issues and other regional and security dynamics. Ambassador Khan's distinguished career as a Pakistani diplomat gives him unique perspective on the next chapter of U.S.-Pakistan relations. We are also delighted that Ambassador Richard Olson, USIP Senior Advisor, is with us and will be moderating our conversation with the Ambassador and taking questions from our virtual audience. We invite you to pose your questions via the chat function on our website, and we welcome you to follow the discussion on Twitter using the hashtag at USIP Pakistan. With your permission, please allow us to hand the floor to Ambassador Olson to begin today's discussion. Good afternoon to uh, our uh, viewers uh, here in the States and good evening in, uh, in Pakistan and a uh, warm welcome to Ambassador Khan. And uh, what, a, what a pleasure it is to be doing this in person. I think the first, uh, first event in person that we're doing at, uh, at USIP. Um, Dr. Dr. Khan, I'd like to start off our discussion by asking you about your vision for the relationship between Pakistan uh, and the United States. As, um, uh, as uh, President uh, Lise Grande just uh, said, the relationship has been framed for much of the past two decades by <coughs> Afghanistan, at least from Washington's perspective. It has been framed by the conflict in Afghanistan, from which we are at least ending our military engagement. Uh, by counterterrorism concerns and sort of looming in the background the nuclear weapons question. And I would like to hear your views um, with, about where you think the relationship might be going now that we're at this important inflection point. Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador Olson, and uh, thank you very much, uh, President uh, Lise Grande, for uh, hosting me this afternoon. A good afternoon to your audience, and also uh, a very good evening uh, to, to my compatriots in Pakistan. Uh, it is really, uh, I would say, a special privilege uh, to be the first speaker doing uh, the first physical interaction at uh, the U.S. Institute of Peace. We uh, have, uh, over the years, uh, in working together. Uh, back then, my host was now our national security advisor, Dr. Muid Yusuf. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, thank you very much uh, for having me. Now, I think uh, you are right uh, in describing uh, the present 
uh, as an inflection point uh, in our relationship. Uh, and I think uh, uh, for the past 20 years, uh, Afghanistan uh, and uh, uh, circumstances surrounding the situation in Afghanistan, the ups and downs uh, in the conflict uh, in Afghanistan has uh, uh, frankly uh, defined uh, the content, uh, the tone and context of the relationship. So I uh, cannot see a future uh, without uh, first uh, uh, looking at uh, the background in which Afghanistan situation has evolved and our capacity to do it right. Because if we are able to uh, bring uh, the Afghanistan conflict uh, to a mutually satisfactory conclusion, I think that would uh, largely uh, and in so many ways uh, affect the future of the relationship. So if you ask me uh, now, I think uh, we should all be thinking about uh, finding ways uh, in which we can do Afghanistan right. Because if we are able to do Afghanistan right, uh, it will definitely enhance our ability to work together. Not that it should be like that, unfortunately, frankly, because uh, we were friends uh, much before Afghanistan happened, and I do uh, look forward uh, to being friends with the United States, and we do all in Pakistan, even after Afghanistan is resolved. But since Afghanistan is the primary and principal preoccupation in Washington, inside the Beltway today, uh, I feel it is absolutely important for us to basically uh, see ways, explore ways, think of ways in which we can do it right. And uh, frankly, uh, things uh, are not looking up in Afghanistan. I, I think that is um, absolutely correct, that it is a difficult situation in Afghanistan. Those of us who watch Afghanistan right now are familiar that, uh, with the fact that the Taliban seems to be uh, militarily ascendant, at least in certain areas, uh, gaining ground in uh, provincial areas and outlying areas. Um, so I think that the question that I would want to ask you, and, and bearing in mind that Pakistan will have bear the impact of uh, intensified civil war in Afghanistan, um, and Pakistan has played, of course, an important role in the peace process and has influence uh, with, uh, with the Taliban, uh, which is now ascendant. Um, you, you said it's important that we do it right, but it is hard to do it right. And what would you want to see uh, in terms of U.S. policy with Afghanistan um, as it relates to, to Pakistan? What do you think the U.S. should be doing in Afghanistan? Uh, again, I think, uh, you know, we, uh, Afghanistan, and I've been working on this relationship now uh, for many years uh, directly mm -hmm. uh, and for some decades uh, uh, indirectly. Uh, and uh, particularly for the past 20 years, uh, we did have, I would say, our differences uh, uh, on uh, how to do it, and uh, that is how uh, I believe Afghanistan uh, for some time did become a contention in our relationship. Uh, but today, clearly, I think Afghanistan is a convergence uh, between Pakistan and United States because uh, uh, you do want uh, to see peace and stability. Uh, we certainly want to see peace and stability. Uh, we want uh, all the parties uh, to get to some understanding which results in an inclusive end state uh, in Afghanistan. You want to see reduction in violence, we want to see reduction in violence. And I think that uh, provides us uh, uh, with a huge, huge basis uh, to, to work from. Uh, and now the question is that what is it that uh, we can do together? Uh, in, in terms of supporting uh, the peace process. Because really, Ambassador, and I'll be very candid with you and through you with your audience, because today 
uh, when I look at uh, uh, the papers in the morning and I uh, listen to some of the discussions taking place across the think tank circuit, uh, the whole conversation in Washington, D.C. has come around uh, to uh, the protection of embassy, securing of the airport, and the visas uh, for the Afghan uh, interpreters. Uh, which is, uh, uh, frankly, not what it should be. Uh, we believe that uh, the best uh, investment, investing in peace in Afghanistan, is basically the best uh, counterterrorism measure and best guarantee against uh, fighting terrorism uh, in Afghanistan. And why I say that, I'd like to explain that also, because clearly, you know, uh, I hear a lot of conversation about uh, over the horizon capacity, about uh, uh, countries in the region uh, providing bases. But then the conversation should be about uh, what we can do to make the peace process successful. Because if the peace process is successful, you will have a partner government in Afghanistan. Uh, you will have people you could work with uh, in Afghanistan. And uh, similarly, uh, you know, I think peace process uh, uh, has uh, to be basically uh, the intra-Afghan negotiations have been obviously uh, complicated and uh, uh, has been difficult. Uh, but if you look at uh, how things have played out, uh, and I, I have always maintained that uh, if uh, uh, the US-Taliban negotiations were maybe three on a scale of one to 10 in terms of complexity, uh, the intra-Afghan negotiations are at least eight or nine in terms of complexity. So if uh, uh, it took United States uh, maybe a year and a year and a half to get to a point where you could actually agree on some basics, uh, then intra-Afghan process perhaps would have or should take longer. And if that time frame is reduced because there is a date for your withdrawal from Afghanistan, uh, then I think that uh, should be made up by putting more capital uh, behind or in support of the peace process. So what is it that US, Pakistan, and not just United States and Pakistan, I think what is it that uh, China, Russia, Iran can do uh, to support the pro peace process. And I think uh, the Afghan parties need to hear it. Uh, both parties, the Taliban and the Afghan government, uh, need to hear it very clearly and very loudly. Uh, and I think the extended Troika declaration, uh, which again is a reflection of the broad regional consensus, uh, of all the key players and of all the countries that have uh, over the past many years uh, invested in various ways uh, in the peace process, have some channels of communication with Taliban and the national government also. So, and that those two declarations clearly, I think, provide that basis uh, for all of our countries to work together uh, perhaps with greater political capital into the peace process. Just perhaps one last question on Afghanistan, then maybe we can move on to some of the uh, more uh, of the bilateral issues between the United States and, uh, and Pakistan. Uh, but um, there, it seems that in terms of how the Afghan peace process has gone uh, so far, that uh, the Republic side has been prepared to entertain uh, notions of substance, and the Taliban side really has not, has not engaged on, on matters of substance. They have an agreement uh, with the United States that deals with withdrawal and counterterrorism assurances principally, uh, but have not engaged with their Afghan counterparts on the substance of the actual uh, vision for, uh, for Afghanistan. 
Um, so with the departure of U.S. forces, it would seem there would be no reason not to, uh, uh, for the Taliban not to uh, engage substantively. Um, and yet uh, the most recent statement is uh, they are waiting for about a month to put them out. So it, it put, together, put out a, a peace proposal. Um, so it looks a bit like the, the Taliban is um, seeking to enhance its military advantage so it can be in a stronger position. So isn't it really the responsibility, as you say, of the region as a whole now, given diminished U.S. influence, to pass a message especially to the Taliban that it is time for accommodation uh, and for compromise and for uh, direct negotiations with um, the Republic side on, on substantive issues? Uh, trust me, that's the message. And if you uh, read the fine print of uh, the two declarations that mm -hmm. I am alluding to, I mean, they are not uh, the national conversations that uh, individual countries have with Taliban. Uh, whatever we tell them uh, is, is separate, but these two declarations clearly uh, give, out the, give out those messages that uh, taking over Kabul by force will not be acceptable. Mm -hmm. And that, uh, you know, all countries support an inclusive end state, which when translated into plain English means that they have to basically get to a common understanding. Uh, there has also been a clear message on the reduction uh, of uh, violence uh, reaching uh, to the point of a comprehensive ceasefire between all the parties. Uh, and really, I think, and then Pakistan has consistently maintained uh, one, that uh, you know, peace process is a shared responsibility. Two, that we would want to see uh, the U.S. withdrawal synchronize with progress in the peace process. Uh, we don't want a precipitate U.S. withdrawal. Uh, and, and clearly, you know, I, I hear, uh, when I hear the President of the United States uh, say that, uh, uh, you know, the, this is not a winnable war, but then peace certainly is winnable, Ambassador. Uh, and I think that's where we need to put uh, our energies and that is where we need to focus on because we have also always consistently maintained that there is no military solution. And I think that realism is there uh, with all the parties today, which perhaps was not there before. Uh, but then what is missing is the recognition that peace is the best way forward because uh, I think the United States uh, has invested the most in, in terms of resources. Uh, the region has lost uh, too many lives. And I think uh, it's not just about saving the homeland. Uh, and it's not just about uh, the ISIS and Al Qaeda threat. Uh, I think it's about the people of Afghanistan. It's about the people of the region and their expectations. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where, uh, because Al-Qaeda was a threat yesterday, and if I were to use any metrics of US success, then you succeeded uh, within maybe a year of your arrival in Afghanistan, because we worked together in, in dismantling Al-Qaeda completely. Now, to basically, to change the way of life of a people, I believe is a choice that perhaps should be left to the people. And identification of the right enemy is absolutely critical. And I think it's important that that mistake is not made again. And uh, it has to be uh, a solution which involves all Afghan parties. And we as outsiders can only help and support. And I can tell you and I can speak for the government of Pakistan ambassador. We have very clearly, you know, our prime minister was in Kabul. Our army chief and DGISI was in Kabul. Uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah Abdullah was in Pakistan. Uh, there are other key leaders who have visited Pakistan. We have reached out to everyone. Our prime minister has been absolutely clear and categorical in saying that whosoever uh, is in government in Pakistan, you know, or in Afghanistan, uh, we will be ready to deal with them.
Well, I really, I like the phrase, peace is winnable. I think, uh, I think the US, US Institute of Peace can, uh, can endorse that, <laughs> that, that, uh, that approach. Um, if I might shift, Ambassador, uh, I'd like to talk about uh, some of the, 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 uh, the broader aspects of the US-Pakistan uh, relationship. And in particular, I wanted to ask you about uh, the concept of geoeconomics, uh, which was announced, I think, this March in Islamabad um, as uh, the defining uh, idea for Pakistan's foreign policy going forward, a shift from geopolitics uh, to geoeconomics. And, uh, and I think that's um, a very interesting and welcome development, um, but I think we're looking to see what the flesh would be on those, uh, on those bones. I wonder if you can help us to understand what uh, Pakistan means by uh, geoeconomics and what that might mean for the, the implications for the relationship with the United States, um, especially since our economic relationship is um, important but, uh, but, but relatively small and smaller than, say, the security cooperation that has existed uh, in past years. So I wonder how you see geoeconomics as a framing relationship for the U.S. and how uh, the government of Pakistan on plans to go about implementing this geoeconomics vision? Uh, you know, I, I would uh, invite you to go back to my opening remarks that I made uh, in my first presentation here at USIP as Pakistan's ambassador almost two and a half years ago. Uh, and the central theme and message was that, uh, you know, we want to put our house in order. Uh, and uh, doing the uh, economy right uh, is the best way uh, to mm -hmm. strengthen Pakistan internally. And therefore, our foreign policy should be driven by our economic interests, by the uh, preference and priority of the government to provide better life and livelihood to our people, you know. So that is what uh, uh, geoeconomics is for us, and uh, it is uh, those economic considerations that uh, it's not to say that politics will be completely divorced, but uh, uh, economics uh, uh, will be a very important factor uh, in uh, uh, helping us uh, set our priorities and then in guiding us in making the choices that we wish to make. Uh, in, in terms of uh, our relationships, uh, both in the region uh, and beyond. Now, uh, I will very respectfully slightly differ. Uh, while, yes, our economic relationship may be small when you look at it from Washington, uh, and ideally it should be much bigger, uh, maybe 20 times bigger than what it is, and I frankly and, and personally see a uh, huge potential for growth uh, in our, but having said that, despite all the issues and challenges uh, that we have uh, faced over the past 20 years, United States uh, is still the largest export destination uh, for Pakistan, you know, if you combine our goods exports and services exports, they come to around $6.2 billion. Mm -hmm. And IT sector is our largest uh, uh, export sector in Pakistan. And in that area, uh, almost 80% of our export is directed at United States. So it's, uh, and not just that, you know, United States is also, I mean, on my way here, I was looking at the investment figures. They may have gone down, comparatively speaking, in recent years, but if you look at the trajectory of U.S. investments in Pakistan, the United States has been all along one of the five top investors uh, in Pakistan. The United States uh, is the, it used to be the third largest remittance provider, but today it is the fourth largest remittance provider, which is $2.4 or $5 billion annually. Uh, so, uh, and I, and in saying that, frankly, we are just scratching the surface. Because uh, where we are 
in the region, the size of our economy, uh, the, the commonalities that we have uh, by way of uh, uh, us belonging to the common law uh, tradition uh, or legal tradition, you know, our sense of contract uh, and rights and obligations is same as yours, you know. Uh, our uh, uh, understanding of property rights is also the same as yours. Uh, most of our, uh, you know, entrepreneurs are either educated or, uh, you know, uh, they had their education here. So, and then the question and something that Prime Minister alluded to uh, in his interview uh, with the New York Times the other day. And, and this is really a point uh, uh, that uh, uh, I believe in also. Uh, in Japan, there is a saying that uh, all ships on a rising tide rise together, you know. So we are in a region, you know, we are sandwiched between two of the largest economies, two of the fastest growing economies, and we would like to position ourselves in a way uh, that uh, we will remain net consumer of energy for as long as I can see in the future. United States is fast emerging uh, as a net exporter of energy, you know, and I see a clear convergence there in future. Uh, agriculture, we have more mouths to feed than any other part of the world, you know, and that is not going to change anytime soon. You are a major agricultural producer. Uh, that is another area where I see a convergence and complementarity between your industry and your, our, uh, uh, you know, industry. Uh, Middle East is a net food importer. Uh, so, energy, agriculture, technology, I think these are uh, the areas where I feel uh, there is uh, tremendous potential. There is tremendous potential. Uh, and, and particularly as the global uh, supply chain is being reconfigured, I think Pakistan uh, uh, is well placed, well placed uh, to be uh, an important part uh, of that uh, supply chain. And in particular, you know, look at, I think this is again something uh, which is either overseen or is uh, not uh, appreciated as much as it should. We are the third largest uh, uh, littoral state on the Indian Ocean Rim. Uh, and uh, we are on the mouth of uh, the state of Hormuz and, and the Arabian Sea, you know. And uh, we are a big country. We are uh, the fifth largest country in the world. So those are uh, most trade would pass through or close to Pakistan. Our own trade flows through those channels, you know. Uh, so we have, uh, and already, I think, uh, the U.S. companies, Exxon Mobil, Accelerate, uh, Cargill, uh, all these companies have set up uh, their operations uh, uh, in South, uh, in Karachi, around Karachi, uh, which again, I think, is a sign of a growing U.S. corporate interest and footprint in Pakistan. Yes, and those, uh, as you say, Ambassador, the market fundamentals are, are actually good for Pakistan. Some of them, including, uh, uh, you didn't mention, but a growing population and a growing middle class population that um, um, makes for, uh, for uh, good markets, potentially. Um, but um, I would want to just press you a little bit on this investment question because uh, it, Pakistan has improved as, an, um, as a, a business-friendly place. It has risen on the uh, World Bank's ease of doing business um, uh, scale, uh, but it, um, it probably still has some more work uh, to be done, I would Lord. think. Yes, and I wonder if you can tell us what initiatives uh, the government is thinking to make it easier for existing investors and for uh, potentially to attract future investors into, into I, Pakistan. I, I couldn't agree more, and, and we need to do a lot more, and uh, we are determined uh, to do a lot more. Uh, and uh, I think uh, improving uh, the ease of uh, doing business uh, standing or index uh, uh, is is something which is very close to Prime Minister's heart mm -hmm. because as, as as you also pointed out, you know, I think uh, 
uh, all other fundamentals are solid and sound when it comes to we have a mar growing market, you know, the rate of return is good, you know, companies uh, uh, find it attractive to go there uh, in Pakistan. But then it is the regulatory complexities, you know, uh, that uh, make things difficult for businesses to operate. Uh, and uh, that's where the Prime Minister has actually put his personal capital also. Uh, we have improved by about uh, uh, 28 points. This year the World Bank report is I think expected next month. We hope to go further up uh, on that list also. And not just that, uh, the FBR has just uh, uh, announced uh, uh, this one window project uh, which basically enables uh, the exporters and importers and it brings together the entire Pakistani system, all the regulatory bodies, agencies and ministries mm -hmm. uh, under one roof or in one window uh, and that uh, process has been streamlined. So this is yet another uh, example of uh, uh, the steps that the government is, is taking to improve and the other I think very important uh, part and this is something that I have sensed and experienced here in Washington DC which is uh, the willingness of our leadership uh, particularly the economic leadership uh, to engage with the US businesses directly to hear uh, their concerns and then to make a serious and sincere effort to address those concerns because frankly, and, and this is a recognition which is there in our system, we got to have happy investors in Pakistan. And, and uh, it is only when we have happy investors that they will basically relay that message back to others uh, in their system. So with that in mind, uh, we do uh, keep those communications open. Uh, the US-Pakistan Business Council uh, has been organizing uh, uh, interactions with our economic leadership, with the Minister for Finance, Minister for Economic Affairs Division, Minister for uh, Advisor on Commerce, uh, Minister for Industries. Uh, and uh, uh, their concerns have been even pre-budget consultations, post-budget uh, feedback, uh, and uh, data protection bill. We even got uh, the deadline extended, you know, for the feedback from the U.S. corporate sector because U.S. remains a big, important player. So what I'm trying to say is that we recognize this. Uh, we want to do uh, more. Uh, we may still be lacking, uh, but uh, the political will and determination is absolutely there. Thank you, Ambassador. Uh, you mentioned uh, that you are next door to the largest market in the world. And of course, uh, China looms large in, in Washington uh, these days. Um, this administration has followed the previous administration in defining great power competition as one of the defining challenges of our time. And, uh, and there's a bipartisan consensus that dealing with uh, uh, China's activities that are inimical to our interests is, is a central framing element of our, uh, of our foreign policy. Uh, and uh, Pakistan, of course, has had a relationship, a long-standing relationship uh, with China uh, that has uh, been enhanced in, in recent years, especially with the uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, but in other dimensions uh, as well. So I wonder how you see, and, and the government, I think, has been very clear that it does not see its relationship as a, as a zero-sum game between the United States and uh, uh, and China, but nonetheless, I would be interested in how you see Pakistan straddling what it seems to be an increasing divide between Washington and Beijing, especially when I think from the Washington perspective, there will be strategic choices that will be, need to be made at some point, uh, perhaps about the digital divide that seems to be emerging between uh, uh, the, uh, the West, if I may use that term, and, uh, and, uh, and China on 5G issues and, and others. I'd be interested in your thoughts on how Pakistan sees itself navigating this um, uh, relationship between two of its principal partners. I think, Ambassador, uh, that uh 
is uh, going to be a challenge uh, uh, for uh, our community. And when I say our community, I mean diplomatic community and, and uh, all of us who work for different uh, diplomatic establishments uh, uh, will have to basically uh, deal with this challenge. Uh, and uh, now, if uh, I were to basically put it uh, in one phrase in terms of uh, uh, how we see it uh, uh, from where we are situated, uh, we clearly uh, see uh, enough space for both United States and China uh, to coexist and cooperate. Uh, and uh, in fact, uh, that uh, cooperation uh, uh, actually serves the best interests of both China and United States. And not only that, uh, it also serves the interests of the region. Uh, and particularly, I would say Afghanistan is a space where we believe uh, it should be the arena for uh, uh, cooperation rather than competition or rivalry. Uh, and the other phrase that I'd like to use is that while you are the indispensable nation, uh, China today uh, is a or an irresistible country for many developing countries uh, for what they bring to the table uh, in terms of uh, uh, trade uh, and investment related incentives, in terms of uh, economic assistance and support. Uh, and and uh, these are obviously uh, considerations uh, which will weigh heavily with countries, uh, and uh, they will make choices based on uh, you know, how they read and they see uh, their best interest. Uh, as a professional diplomat, uh, my view uh, on uh, this uh, is that uh, I personally don't see uh, uh, the a potential replay uh, of the Cold War uh, in the manner and style of hard alliances that uh, the world witnessed uh, during the Cold War times where you know there was this one silo where all Warsaw Pact countries were positioned and then there was this uh, NATO alliance and then countries were just uh, trading uh, with countries that were part of that uh, alliance structure you know. I personally don't see it going that far. Uh, it is hard uh, uh, for uh, those who see this competition intensify to basically read the future as we speak. Uh, but uh, uh, we, uh, in Pakistan at least, you know, we, we feel uh, that uh, you know, the, the space exists. Pakistan has very successfully managed good relations, even during Cold War times, good relations between China and United States. Uh, we are definitely keen uh, and determined uh, to maintain that balance. How far we will succeed uh, is, is, is a question uh, on which I would say the jury is still out, uh, but at least the intention definitely uh, is there. Mm -hmm. Uh, as perhaps a follow-on question to that, Ambassador, I think we, we probably do need to talk about a couple of um, human rights issues. And one of the um, uh, areas of concern, at least uh, in Washington, as I'm sure you have detected, but amongst um, credible uh, human rights organizations like Amnesty International, as well as the uh, plight of the Uyghurs in, uh, in China. Uh, and while Pakistan has been um, a, a leading advocate for uh, the rights of Kashmiris um, and expressed great concern about the human rights uh, concern of Kashmiris, uh, there does not seem to have been an equivalent uh, expression of concern uh, about the Uyghurs and their condition in, in China. I wonder if you could help us to understand uh, how those are distinguished in Pakistani eyes. Uh, I think, and, and this is uh, almost uh, one uh, question that is always asked and raised, you know, uh, in, in most of our interactions. Uh, uh, and uh, I can uh, only say 
that uh, you know uh, these are two very very different situations so far as Pakistan is concerned, uh, uh, and therefore we really don't uh, see any comparison because first of all Kashmir uh, is a dispute uh, between India and Pakistan, and Pakistan uh, is uh, a party. Uh, that has uh, a legitimate right to voice its concerns on whatever happens uh, there. And uh, those voices of concern have not just been raised by Pakistan, uh, but they have been raised by the UN High Commissioner uh, for Human Rights. They have been raised by the European Commission. They have been raised by international bodies, OIC. Uh, and in many cases, we echo uh, what is being said by these internationally acknowledged and recognized uh, uh, assessments and evaluations. Uh, the, the second uh, point is that uh, really I think when uh, this question is raised here, I see uh, built into that question is this expectation uh, for us to basically uh, act and behave like United States. We are not United States of America. Uh, and uh, the way you raise those issues, uh, obviously Pakistan uh, cannot raise those issues. And if there are uh, problems uh, that uh, we see uh, with our friends, uh, then we raise them, but we raise them privately. We don't raise them uh, publicly. Uh, so in that regard, and also I think uh, uh, when uh, these things uh, uh, are uh, taken to the Chinese, they obviously uh, do not accept those versions or accounts, you know, and they challenge that. Uh, and in support of uh, uh, their contention, they, they, they would argue that uh, there are no refugees. Uh, the, the genocide is claimed, but uh, where is the evidence? So obviously they challenge uh, the assertions that are made, but it is not for us to sit in judgment on what is being said here or what is being explained by the Chinese side. Uh, where we have concerns, we do voice them, but we do voice them privately. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to uh, talk a little bit about press freedom, if I could. Uh, there's, of course, a, a, a widespread feeling that throughout South Asia, uh, there is increasing pressure on uh, the free press. Um, and unfortunately, it seems Pakistan is not an exception uh, to, to that trend. Uh, there have been several prominent incidents uh, recently of uh, journalists uh, uh, either uh, disappearing temporarily or uh, unfortunately sometimes permanently um, and a, a feeling perhaps of greater pressure uh, from uh, from the state on uh, the free press in in Pakistan and I wonder if I can ask you to uh, uh, address those concerns uh, well first of all uh, I think uh, uh, while focusing on uh, the concerns uh, and uh, things that uh, may actually be missing uh, from uh, the equation in Pakistan, I think it is also important uh, to, to look at and appreciate uh, what we have and uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, the, the availability of uh, the number of channels, in terms of uh, uh, the uh, existing media freedoms where people say what they must and people write what they can and uh, uh, even if you look at uh, all those stories uh, uh, that uh, are reported today uh, from Pakistan about various so-called uh, violations you know they are reported locally because I come from a generation you know uh, uh, who grew up uh, uh, that grew up uh, in the 70s and the 80s, you know, and uh, uh, in those times, uh, all of those uh, stories were broken by foreign media houses. So this is one measure uh, of uh, the freedom that, uh, you know, media and journalists have. And this government is in particular committed and uh, uh, the, there is a bill already uh, with the parliament, you know, for the protection uh, of journalists, you know, uh, and 
that intent uh, should be correctly read. So as I was saying in another context earlier, that uh, uh, the, the political will and intent to provide the protections and freedoms that are basically uh, promised uh, in the constitution of Pakistan is definitely there. It is not just uh, that, uh, uh, you know, protection of journalist bill, but uh, uh, there are other initiatives also in the pipeline that uh, would provide the journalists uh, the protections that uh, they need. I know the situation may not be ideal. I'm, I'm not saying uh, that uh, uh, this is uh, where we would like to be. Uh, but I can also say uh, that, uh, uh, you know, uh, our leadership and our system is, is definitely committed uh, to provide a level playing field and an open space uh, for our journalists, you know, to, to report what they do. And in most cases, they are able to do that. And I think that aspect, unfortunately, uh, doesn't get highlighted as much as it should be. Um, Ambassador, I'd like to uh, ask you one more question, and then I think we're going to open it up for questions and answers from, uh, from our uh, virtual audience. So I hope the questions are being generated and fed in, and um, uh, we'll turn to the audience's concerns in a few minutes. But let me just ask about, um, in conclusion, about your relationship with your neighbor to the east. Uh, Earlier this year, uh, uh, General Bajwa uh, said Pakistan is ready to resolve all outstanding issues with its neighbors through dialogue in a dignified and peaceful manner. Uh, and I think this was um, uh, striking, uh, not least because it was delivered by an army chief, and sometimes uh, in Washington, at least, the army is con considered to be more hardline uh, on, on these issues. So that seemed to uh, represent a real possible opening. Um, uh, at the same time, it seems that um, perhaps there's been a hardening uh, of events uh, since then. But I wonder how you would how you would see the possibility of a genuine dialogue uh, between uh, India and Pakistan. I, I wish I could be half as optimistic as I am about uh, the prospects of uh, the peace process in Afghanistan. Because uh, frankly, uh, the way things are developing between India and Pakistan, uh, I, although I have uh, always been someone uh, who believes uh, in, a, in a, a normal, uh, relationship and you are absolutely right and it's both ironical and sad uh, that uh, when uh, we have a prime minister uh, who is uh, clearly uh, invested in uh, a normal relationship uh, with uh, India, uh, a leader who uh, wishes to resolve our outstanding uh, issues with India through dialogue and engagement uh, and a and an army chief who shares that vision completely. Uh, we uh, have uh, a leader and uh, we have a government uh, that uh, has unfortunately uh, built uh, a career out of punching Pakistan. And I think that uh, creates a complication in our relationship uh, that uh, essentially uh, leaves the normalization uh, to the ups and downs of Indian domestic politics. So whenever and wherever uh, the government, uh, the BJP-led government under Prime Minister Modi would come under domestic political stress, uh, they would want to use Pakistan as a punching bag uh, to basically uh, prop up their uh, falling approval ratings. And this is, I think, uh, both uh, uh, sad and uh, uh, very unfortunate for the prospects of peace uh, uh, between India uh, and Pakistan. Uh, clearly, you know, if you look at uh, uh, 
uh, what is happening in Kashmir. I mean, despite all uh, the draconian measures that uh, the government took, uh, despite all the restrictions that have been imposed, the arrests that continue, uh, the people of Kashmir still are as opposed to those measures uh, that uh, were taken unilaterally by the Indian government. And even uh, those political leaders who are essentially seen uh, as more friendly uh, to New Delhi government, even they came out very clearly uh, in opposing uh, what uh, has been done uh, by the BJP government. So uh, really, I think uh, there is a need uh, uh, to bring back uh, some trust and confidence uh, in the relationship and uh, we need to basically get to a point where at least uh, uh, we go to the status quo ante uh, and uh, then start it from there uh, in terms of uh, uh, there being this enabling environment, you know, which allows both parties to engage. Uh, whether uh, the government in India has uh, the will or the inclination to do that, I am not sure. Uh, and uh, frankly, uh, I think this is where uh, United States uh, and the international community comes in. I think uh, it is important for uh, India to see and hear it uh, from other important countries also because their unilateralism uh, is uh, uh, threatening uh, peace, security and stability. And as uh, President uh, Grande mentioned in her opening remarks that uh, you know, this is one part of uh, the world where you have three nuclear powers uh, in close proximity to each other uh, with active territorial disputes playing out, you know. Uh, that should not uh, give uh, uh, too much comfort to anyone. Uh, and that should only basically make parties uh, uh, even more keen uh, to engage and uh, uh, seek uh, resolutions uh, through dialogue. If, if I could, just one quick follow-on to that, because it does raise a very important uh, question, which is uh, it, the fact that uh, the line of control between uh, Pakistan uh, and India, uh, uh, between uh, Azad Jammu Kashmir and Jammu and Kashmir on the other side, uh, is perhaps the most dangerous place in the world. You have two nuclear uh, weapon states uh, uh, eyeball to eyeball uh, with a history of conflicts and escalatory cycles that um, very nearly have not ended with the most recent one being the Pulwama uh, Balakot uh, yes. crisis which uh, uh, to some observers looked like it was very near to spiraling entirely out of control. Uh, are, is there any prospect for enhancing strategic stability between India and Pakistan? And as you mentioned now with the injection perhaps of China, um, separate and apart from dealing with these difficult and thorny political questions, are there, are there areas that strategic stability between India and Pakistan could be enhanced since it would presumably be in the interest of both countries to avoid the possibility of an escalatory cycle getting out of control and leading to an exchange of nuclear I, weapons? I, I think, again, the, the basic uh, uh, framework uh, or any conversation will have to start from some uh, level of trust and confidence on both sides. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, the situation in Kashmir has vitiated the environment to a point uh, that uh, there is frankly uh, very little or no engagement uh, with India. So, uh, and these are complex issues. Uh, even under normal circumstances, you have to have a certain level uh, of uh, trust to be able to engage in these conversations. So, uh, which is really, I, you know, my, and, and I'm not saying this as much as Pakistan's ambassador as I'm saying this as uh, uh, a student of uh, uh, South Asia. You know, it's really, and then I will 
get come back to the point that I made earlier, which is really not a good sign. Uh, and that is that Pakistan uh, has somehow become integrated into the domestic political politics of India. And, and BJP has used it. Today, in a way, we miss uh, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Bajpai for his investment in peace, for his commitment to uh, normalization, you know. Uh, but uh, looking at what is there in line in the BJP hierarchy, I frankly dread the day when we will start missing Prime Minister Modi. So that's the trend, and I think this is where United States uh, and other countries uh, need to basically pay more attention uh, to the trajectory uh, on which uh, 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 India is drifting. Uh, and uh, your positions should not be seen uh, as an endorsement uh, of the Indian positions on Pakistan and Kashmir, because that only unfortunately emboldens them. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. I'd like to turn to our first question from the audience, which is how would you answer Afghan concerns that Pakistan has not supported its elected government, the government of uh, Afghanistan, and continues to give safe haven to the Taliban? I, I, I think uh, we uh, have not one, not two, so many processes in place uh, and conversation track uh, with the Afghan government, uh, uh, the APEPS process, all the working groups. Uh, uh, we have always uh, showed our keenness uh, to engage uh, with the Afghan government, uh, and uh, sometimes uh, uh, our sincere efforts uh, are not reciprocated uh, the way they should be. Uh, and uh, unfortunately, there is this tendency also uh, to also keep blaming Pakistan for all the ills of Afghanistan, uh, which uh, is not the case. And Taliban, in any case, do not need uh, sanctuaries in Pakistan because they are increasingly occupying space and territory in Afghanistan. Uh, what we have made very clear uh, is that uh, we want Afghan parties to talk to each other and we are ready to help in every possible way. So it's not about uh, providing sanctuaries or providing support. It's about our very clearly articulated position and a position uh, that we are actually walking the talk also in terms of extending whatever support we can to the Afghan process, uh, peace process. Uh, and as I said in the beginning, I, I really I think that uh, uh, Pakistan and all other important countries that are in a position to contribute uh, should contribute to that. Uh, and uh, Havens uh, is really uh, a, a question uh, that, uh, frankly, has become irrelevant. Well, uh I, I do have to push back a little bit on that, Mr. Ambassador, because uh, I think as long as the Taliban are able to get, uh, the fighters are able to get medical attention in Pakistan, um, it, the, the issue will continue to mean, remain live in the, in the eyes of Afghans. Uh, so uh, that in itself is just one, one small example. But uh, to turn to the next question, what do you see as the role for neighboring countries to ensure regional security and stability as Afghanistan's situation uh, deteriorates? I think I've been trying to answer this question. Uh, I think uh, uh, the best role that uh, the neighbors can play uh, is to essentially give the same message uh, to all parties uh, with, with whomsoever they have any influence uh, that uh, uh, the only way forward uh, is to get to some common understanding uh, and uh, to not because that's where the challenge is, you know. If, uh, and that's why I say, and I, I would say it again, uh, that uh, your best counterterrorism investment is to invest in the peace process. Because uh, if the peace process unravels, 
uh, we will go back uh, to the old uh, scenario where you will have militias. Uh, will countries will start to hedge also? And uh, that is going to be a recipe for disaster. And we have seen that film play uh, in the past also. And Pakistan has suffered tremendously on account of that. So at least I cannot speak for other countries. I can definitely speak for Pakistan. And I can say this very clearly and very loudly in this city, that we want to work and support in every possible way that we can the peace process. And I, I, I personally agree with you uh, profoundly that the regional dimension is uh, hugely important right now and really needs to be addressed. Uh, we have an economic question here. So Pakistan needs sustained cash inflows, uh, including at least $3 billion under the, the dollars under the current IMF program. I think that's the next tranche that's under discussion. Uh, so what can Pakistan do to ensure that foreign flow requirements shift from IMF uh, bailouts, as it's characterized by this question, and towards more sustainable foreign direct investment-led inflows? Uh, you know, ideally, we would want uh, this uh, IMF facility uh, to be the last facility mm -hmm. uh, that we have to ask for or we have to request. Uh, uh, and uh, we really uh, had to resort to this uh, and uh, we have already received close to around $2 billion and uh, we are still in the program and mm -hmm. we expect. Uh, and the idea really is that uh, uh, the IMF support and, and other uh, support from the international financial institutions uh, helped us to get uh, through that economic crisis that uh, the government had uh, uh, inherited and uh, through those uh, stringent uh, uh, and tough reform measures, you know, I think we moved from uh, that crisis uh, uh, phase to uh, the stabilization phase. Uh, and in that, obviously, the support that we got uh, uh, from IMF and other institutions was uh, absolutely critical. But as I said in the beginning, the, the idea really is uh, to create conditions uh, that would attract uh, investments uh, uh, in Pakistan. And uh, I think uh, by COVID was another unforeseen challenge, uh, not just for Pakistan, for any country. Uh, we did uh, reasonably well, I would say, you know, uh, during uh, uh, 19, uh, we had, what, 0.5 contract, you know, the economy contracted just by about half a percent. Uh, this year we have grown and the next year projection is that we will go to 3.9 percent. So really, I think uh, the uh, focus on uh, enhancing agricultural and industrial productivity uh, focus on uh, creating conditions uh, that would uh, allow us to increase uh, our exports. Uh, uh, also, uh, using Pakistan's uh, connectivity potential and using Pakistan as a manufacturing hub by attracting investment. So we have these special economic zones uh, that we are working on, and, and that's where uh, we would uh, like to engage with the United States because those conversations are already taking place as we speak in terms of uh, the elements of uh, engagement with the United States on the economic side. And of that, I think uh, the export processing zones, special economic zones, and U.S. companies coming in and investment investing in Pakistan is a high priority for us. We have uh, some questions here on Balochistan, which of course has been much in the news. The Prime Minister was in Gwadar uh, recently, uh, and you noted that uh, in your remarks that the government wants to strengthen Pakistan internally, but there's unequal development, particularly in Balochistan. That's one question. Uh, and the Prime Minister has said that he is willing to reach out to Baluch insurgents. Why now, and what does the government hope to gain from this outreach? I think uh, what uh, it is very uh, peace internally uh, is an essential prerequisite to, mm -hmm. to, to unleash uh, uh, our economic potential. And uh, 
Balochistan uh, is, uh, uh, you know, uh, underdeveloped, uh, and uh, the lack of uh, stability uh, and uh, the security uh, situation uh, further limits government's ability uh, to undertake development and other uh, economic activities. Uh, Balochistan has uh, huge potential in, in terms of uh, uh, the special economic zones that we have established uh, uh, with the commissioning of the Gawadar port uh, and the building of infrastructure there. Uh, and uh, to be able to basically harness that potential optimally, uh, I think uh, what Prime Minister said was that uh, we are uh, ready uh, to engage with uh, uh, whosoever uh, is interested in, in, in talking uh, and uh, giving up violence, you know, uh, because uh, in certain cases, you know, there are these individuals who are either being abused or misled. Uh, by, uh, by, by some elements. So uh, if engagement can lead to uh, a more uh, stable uh, uh, Balochistan, uh, I think any government uh, would want to do that. Uh, there was a, a question on Kashmir, and uh, the essence of it is would Pakistan uh, relax its claims uh, to Kashmir to facilitate a settlement? I, it's, it's not uh, for any, uh, this is a generational uh, uh, thing. Uh, there, uh, and it's not just Pakistan. I think uh, through the UN Security Council resolutions, uh, the entire international community uh, has promised the Kashmiris uh, to intervene and to give them their right of self-determination. Uh, so it's really not for Pakistan to give up uh, something that is not ours. This is a promise that the international community made, and this is a promise that was made to the people of Kashmir. Uh, and uh, at the end of the day, uh, that choice uh, will have to be exercised. Uh, which way they exercise that choice, uh, it is up to them. But I think they deserve to be given that right, uh, which was promised to them and has been outstanding now for over 70 years. Okay. Do we have one more question? Uh, could, uh, could you talk a bit more about reforms being uh, undertaken to attract investment? Uh, and how can U.S. companies presumably compete with the Pakistan-China uh, free trade agreement? I, I think the size of the pie is large enough. Mm. And uh, uh, I have been very clear and categorical uh, uh, to our friends here uh, in, in terms of uh, offering special economic zones, in terms of offering uh, industry-specific zones, in terms of offering sector-specific zones where all the privileges that are being accorded or given uh, to other special economic zones will be equally granted. Uh, and uh, not just that, as I said also in the beginning, that uh, uh, we feel that, uh, at least in our part of the world, uh, there is uh, this uh, uh, space available uh, for both U.S. Uh, and China to coexist. Uh, and uh, we clearly uh, see enormous potential. And this is something that uh, uh, even today, uh, under CPAC, uh, most of uh, the heavy equipment being used is uh, of uh, Japanese make. It is Komatsu. And most of the generators uh, being used are General Electric. So why can't we create a complementarity if we can? Uh, I know it sounds ambitious, uh, but it definitely uh, is doable in, in terms of uh, the, the size uh, of uh, our market, uh, the connectivity potential. But most importantly, Ambassador, most importantly, I know uh, securing peace uh, in Afghanistan uh, is an important priority here in Washington. Uh, the 
your withdrawal has at least for now made uh, the so-called uh, military force uh, element out of it has taken that element out of equation so what is left uh, is uh, the assistance leverage the recognition legitimacy leverage uh, and trade and investment leverage and and frankly no matter what kind of uh, agreement uh, you come up with and no matter what kind of agreement the Afghan parties sign, if you will not help them transition from a war-centered economy to a normal economy, long-term sustainable peace in Afghanistan will remain a pipe dream. And I think that uh, gives uh, as one additional reason because the conflict in Afghanistan apart from how it has negatively impacted Pakistan over the years uh, has also undermined our growth potential in terms of uh, allowing us to build our relationship uh, across uh, uh, the Central Asian uh, uh, countries you know and uh, peace in Afghanistan and the connectivity potential and I think that's where your companies can really uh, take advantage of the opportunities and even I give you one more example we imported close to 1 billion, over 1 billion dollars of soya bean and cotton from United States as an input uh, for value addition in Pakistan. We uh, have a free trade uh, agreement with China. Your companies can basically create those win-win uh, collaboration where you add value and use Pakistan as a manufacturing hub for distribution in the wider region. And that should be a good reason enough for your companies to come and invest in Pakistan. Very good. Uh, Ambassador, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today. You've been very generous with your time and you've given us a very comprehensive tour d'horizon uh, of the U.S.-Pakistan relationship and all its, uh, all its complexity. Uh, so um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of USIP, thank you uh, again and uh, thank the audience uh, for their participation. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Lovely being here. And uh, enjoyed our conversation today. Thank you.